Hey everybody, welcome to week two, audio coding with Super Collider. I'm just going to do a quick sound check here. So this should be pink noise on the left. And pink noise on the right. So if you're there, say hi. Let me know if you can see me and hear me. And uh, let's get started. <coughs> awesome. Thank you, Behangs. Hey, Amars, how's it going? All right. So uh, last uh, last week we started to get uh, comfortable with uh, the idea of functions and using functions to create little uh, synthesis uh, algorithms, right? Hey, everybody. Thanks for all the haze. Uh, so this, this involves uh, declaring maybe some arguments and some variables. So let's make a, a signal for ourselves. And we'll just play a sine wave at the audio rate. We'll just give it a frequency of 200. And I'm going to set its, uh, I'm going to skip over it. We could say zero for phase, and then we can say 0.2 for mull. And uh, enclosing in parentheses like this lets us use um, command enter to run this very plain and boring monophonic sine wave. So we'll try to spice this up a little bit. Uh, let's see, we can maybe add a, uh, I don't know. Um, another sine wave <coughs> at uh, 201 hertz, right? Same phase, same amplitude. Let's make this uh, three. So we'll just get this little beating pattern. 300. Uh, here's a fun unit generator. Mouse X. So mouse X, we can look at the help file for mouse X. It'll basically take the uh, X, or uh, <clears throat> in other words, the horizontal position of the mouse and turn it into uh, a number. Basically, uh, you can give it a minimum and a maximum. So the minimum is at the left side of the screen, uh, maximum at the right side of the screen. So we'll say, let's go from 200 to 400. And so now um, we can uh, run this again, move the mouse. So, you know, that's, that's the idea. Mouse X is kind of fun. And here's a, a handy method for unit generators. If you ever want to kind of see what your unit generators are doing in terms of numbers, you can put a dot pole on any of them, and then those values will show up in the post window. So that's kind of a nice thing for anyone who's kind of more of a visual person. Uh, let's uh, remember we can um, use the exclamation point to. Uh, when you when you do exclamation point two on something, it becomes an array of that of of two of those things. So this turns sig into an array of two sigs, and then Super Collider's uh, behavior when it encounters an array in a synthesis algorithm is it just puts the first thing in the left, the second thing in the right. So now we've got stereo sound. Um, let's see. Uh, can we make this even more interesting? Let's do um, uh, let's multiply this uh, by yet another sine wave. So we're right now we're just doing doing additive synthesis. So we take a sine wave and we add a, a variable sine wave to it, and we can also uh, let's multiply this signal by a low frequency pulse wave. Um, and we'll have its frequency be H. And that's all we'll do. So before I run this, I, I want everyone to sort of try to think about what this is going to sound like. So LF pulse, um, we can just plot this maybe. Uh, let's do it. We can do better than that. Uh, let's plot more of it. Let's plot one whole second of it. All right. Now this is kind of hard to see, but this is a 
a pulse wave, which is basically turns on and off, so it's alternating between 1 and 0 eight times a second. So if we take that signal, that m moving value, alternating between zeros and ones, and multiply it by our summed sine waves, and think about what that's going to sound like for a second, and let's, then let's play it. And let's do a sine wave instead. And sine waves normally go from um, negative one to positive one, so I'm going to override its default uh, default output and say range uh, 0 to 1. So nor like whatever these eugens, they all have a default range. LF pulse goes from 0 to 1. Sine os goes from negative 1 to, to 1, but you can always just put dot range, and, and then it'll... Uh, so now the sine goes from 0 to 1. So same output range, but instead of going alternating pulse wave up, down, up, down, up, down, sort of instantaneously, now we're going to have a smooth sinusoidal movement. And slow this down so we can really hear the sinusoidal movement. Okay, so anyway, this is this is the the idea with sound functions. This is kind of a fundamental way of working in Super Collider, where you just want to make some sound. So you crack open a pair of curly braces, you declare some variables. Maybe you'll also you know make an argument, call it freak, and say two hundred, and then we can plug this in down here. Maybe we'll say uh, freak and freak plus 200. Uh, I deleted a bunch of stuff, didn't I? That's not what I wanted to do. Uh, freak, comma, freak plus 200. So now uh, it'll sound the same, but we can set, oh, we didn't, we can't set because we didn't give this a name. So let's give this a name. And then we could say x.set freak 300. And from here, you can probably kind of extrapolate, and uh, you know, we could we could add another argument for the frequency of this uh, amplitude modulation that we're doing, this sort of sine pulsing, uh, and and lots of other ideas. You could add more sine waves to it. You can try a different unit generator. So instead of a sine wave source, you have a sawtooth wave or pink noise or anyway. Just want uh, everyone to start feeling comfortable with this. And a good way to get comfortable is to just dive into. Um, some of these uh, help files. Remember, you can highlight or click and press Command D, and you know you can go back to maybe tour of Ugens and just kind of scan through here, and just just pick one, you know, and uh, you know so LF pulse for example, and you can go to its help file, uh, or or what even better is um, you can take uh, just take an example here. Get. Uh, you know, just just to we'll just copy this and paste it in here, and uh, try to pick it apart. You know, I mean, we we can replace this scope with play. I think um, scope is also going to bring up the little uh, waveform scope, but um, you know, basically, just I guess maybe maybe it's a good idea to start with your volume down a little bit. But uh, you know, let's let's just multiply all this by point one. All right, so that seems plenty quiet, so. I'm going to exclamation point to that as well. So what we're looking at here is, you know, we've got a, a sound function. We can sort of make it look like ours a little bit. Right. And uh, we have a eugen called bar saw, so we can look up the help file. It's a variable duty saw. Remember, we can always, we can plot some of it if we want. Just put it in a function and use dot plot to see what it looks like. But basically, it's um, it's a sawtooth wave, and it can sort of, can sort of bend like uh, this way or this way. You know, and so in the middle, it's kind of like a triangle shape. And uh, it's got uh, frequency, phase, and then width, which is the sort of uh, slantiness of the, the bend. And that's being controlled by the uh, mouse Y. And it's probably why they put scope on here. So why don't we just open up our scope as well here and I'm gonna do this so that's what's playing and as I move the mouse vertically because we're using mouse Y here
-hmm. right? It's just kind of changing uh, the the tiltedness, I guess, if for lack of a better term, uh, sort of moving that waveform in one of those two directions. And we get a particular sound, we get a particular shape, and it helps reinforce just the idea of uh, plugging in values or other unit generators for um, different parameters. Takes a little time to get used to, but um, uh, good place to start. So now I want to I want to turn our focus to what we're really going to pay attention to this week, and I want to talk about um, three things in particular. Uh, one of them is envelopes. One of them is arrays, and uh, randomness. So uh, let's start with envelopes, and I'm going to make a super simple sound function. And let's do. Um, I'm just so indecisive. Uh, let's do um, pink noise. Uh, we'll do uh, full amplitude, and I'm gonna say uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna run this pink noise through a bandpass filter. So the input to the filter is our signal, which is pink noise, and I'll set the frequency to be a thousand. And RQ is a measure of how, how narrow the band is. So one is the broadest band possible. And uh, as it approaches zero, the band gets narrower and narrower. So we're going to say 0.1. And uh, we'll play that. I'm also going to say, just let's put it in both speakers. It's a little more pleasant to listen to. Just uh, I can show you what happens as we broaden the band a little bit and narrow. And I'm going to um, scale this up quite a bit. All right, so we've got a sound source. So let's talk about envelopes. This is a this is a non-enveloped sound. All we have is a signal generator going through a filter. And uh, if we just let this run, it goes forever. It doesn't, you know, there's no initial attack of the sound, there's no decay, there's no release, there's no sense of finite duration. It's just an infinite generator that goes on forever. But that's not how, uh, that's not how we think about making music. Songs, you know, compositions, they have a beginning, they have an end, and the sounds that make up those compositions, they have a, a, set, a beginning and an end. So. So envelopes, uh, an envelope is a is a uh, a time domain function that has a particular shape, which we typically apply to the amplitude of a sound, so that the amplitude fades in and then fades out. So I want to start by looking at a class called env. So env is um, it's described as a specification for a segmented envelope. So we're going to look at the method new, which is the I think the most flexible and the most um, uh, the common way of creating envelope shapes in SuperSlider. So we'll give this, um, I guess we'll give this a name. We'll say, uh, we're just going to separate this a little bit, env.new. And env.new needs, uh, typically, we, we can, it's got a bunch of arguments here, but we're just going to focus on the first three, which are uh, levels. And this is, this is uh, env.new in the help file here. So it's levels times curve. So the first item, first argument here, levels is an array of levels. So we create an array. I think we briefly talked about arrays maybe in the um, in the last video, but an array is delineated with square brackets. And then we're going to provide some levels, 0, comma, 1, comma, 0. And so these are our levels. Our envelope is going to start at a, at a value of 0. It's going to then go to 1 and then go to 0. And that's the end of our envelope. And the next is an array of time. So it needs to know how much time to take uh, between, uh, between levels. And this is a value in seconds. So we'll say maybe it takes 2 seconds to go from 0 to 1, and then 4 seconds to go from 1 to 0. So the, the number of items in this array is always going to be one more than this array because we've got you know three points and then two segments to connect those three points then we have a curve and the the default here is the the symbol lin in single quotes 
and that that's short for linear. So it's going to linear linearly interpolate between uh, between points. And and this is all we need to do. So haha, we've made an envelope, but it do, you know doesn't really do anything right now because it just says yep, that's an envelope. Good job. So one thing we can do is um, uh, plot it. And this is this is much more helpful. So here is our envelope that we've created. Uh, the y-axis we have 0 and 1, and this is time in seconds on the x-axis. So we start at 0, and over 2 seconds we go up to 1, and then we go down to 0 over 4 seconds for a total duration of 6 seconds, linear interpolation between points. Okay, that's pretty simple. Uh, uh, often often I, do, I don't use a symbol because uh, it, it will apply to every segment, and sometimes I want uh, different uh, different uh, types of curves between segments. So um, we can also provide numbers here, and the number zero corresponds to linear. So this this will be exactly the same as what we just saw, and I forgot a semicolon, which is why we got that error. So I'm just putting these together. I'm creating the envelope, and then I'm plotting it. So exact same thing, no different. But if we put a uh, one for this first value here, then it's going to bend this linear segment away from linearity a little bit in a particular direction. So it starts to have this exponential flavor to it, right? It's not, uh, I don't know if it's exactly exponential, but that's how I, I like to describe it. And if we say, you know, maybe four, and it's really starting to bend quite a bit. So this first segment's curvature is now pretty far away from linearity, and we can keep going. Um, the, the higher the positive number, the more it bends away from it. So just, just to show you, like here's 20. And it's it's really quite quite bent now. It's, it's you know, extremely, like it, it barely changes and then suddenly at the end it just shoots right up. And negative values will do um, the opposite. So here's negative four. So this bends in the opposite direction. So we can say, you know, maybe, maybe positive four for this one. And so that, that bends in the opposite direction. The, the way to remember uh, how this works is um, uh, if, you, if you specify a negative value for curve, then it will change quickly at first and slowly over time. Right? Quickly at first and then slowly over time. Right? It just sort of, it's, change, it's, it's, it's very vertical at first and then gets horizontal. But if these are positive, then they change slowly at first and then quickly towards the end. Slowly at first, quickly towards the end. Um, so we can, we can add as many segments as we like. Um, we can make an envelope that goes, let's say it goes up really quick, and then it goes down uh, to all, you know, a quiet level, but not zero, and stays there for a while. And then maybe it jumps back up a little bit and finally goes down to zero. So zero to one, 0.2, staying at 0.2 for some duration, going up to 0.5 and back to zero. And so we'll say maybe very quickly it jumps up, tenth of a second, uh, very quickly it jumps down, uh, stays at 0.2 for three seconds, and then uh, 0.2, 0.2 to go up to 0.5 and then back to zero. And we'll just say uh, lin for now. Yeah, so here's, here's that envelope we just made. Starts at zero, bam, over uh, uh, 0.2 seconds it goes up to one, down to 0.2, and then stays there for a while, and then goes up and down. Um, so that's that's um, that's env dot new. Let's let's put it into practice. Uh, uh, we we can't just plug this in here. It's not quite that simple, but it's it's relatively simple. So what I want to do is use this envelope um, to control the amplitude of our filtered pink noise. So uh, uh, so the way we do that is we will. Uh, we'll just copy and paste this. We haven't, and we're going to modify this. So I think we, what we ought to do is make another variable called uh, env, and we're going to say uh, env equals a unit generator called envgen. Let's look at the help file. So envgen um, is a, a signal generator, just like SineOSC and Pink Noise. It generates a signal, and we provide it with an instance of env. So envgen.ar or kr. The first thing it needs is an instance of env, and we've we've made one of those. It's it's right here. 
Um, so what we'll do is we'll say mgen.kr, and just a quick note here, um, uh, uh, just to, I forget how much we talked about AR and KR. Uh, AR is audio rate, KR is control rate. And uh, a good way to think of this, a, a, a somewhat easy way to think about this is AR, are like, it's like a high resolution digital audio file and KR is like a lower resolution. And there are some cases in audio and, 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 and digital art and things where you, know, you don't need a super high resolution thing. If you just have a blue background, you don't need a million billion pixels to represent that. You can go kind of low resolution to save some computer space or computer memory. Um, so if you have a slow moving signal or something with just you know maybe a ramp from zero to one over 10 seconds, you don't need to output a million billion samples to represent that. You can, you can go a little bit lower resolution. That's what KR is for. So it, it would be fine to use AR for an audio rate envelope. Uh, it's probably fine to use KR. I think the only time you'd ever want to use AR is if you have a really, really fast attack and release and you really want to capture all of the nuance and resolution of that. Okay, anyway, back to business. We, we are opening up parentheses on nvgen.kr, uh, and the first thing it needs is an envelope. So I'm going to copy this, and I'm going to put it right here. And are we done? Well, that's a good question. We could try to play it right now. Let's see what happens. No, it's not working. And the reason it's not working is we have correctly created an engine, but we haven't actually used it to control the amplitude of the sound. So we have to make sure to not only define it, but also apply it. So we define our envelope, we define our sound source, we apply some filtering and some amplitude compensation because we have such a narrow band. And then we're gonna take that signal and multiply it by our envelope and then make it stereo. Yeah, so that's working. Uh, let's, let's make this a little bit uh, simpler. I guess let's let's do just a simple percussive envelope so we can we'll go back to what we had originally which is like zero one zero and let's have it just be a hundredth of a second going to uh, going down uh, for the release over one second and let's say it goes up linearly but goes down with um, with a curvature like this so this this will look like this this is a, a proper percussive envelope. So it's going to basically come on more or less immediately and then decay uh, with that little exponential shape. And I've got a lot of windows open that I never close. So here's a good trick. We'll just say window dot close all. And that will just close all of our plot windows that we opened up. Because um, I, don't, I don't like clutter. So uh, Right. So now oh, okay. So that's Here's a fun little error message. We're getting, it's a bunch of gibberish here. And if we scroll up, it should say, ooh, give us a clue as to what's going on. All right, message as multi-channel array, not understood. I can see how that might not be particularly meaningful, but I know the problem. Uh, the problem is that we have dot plot here. So this, if we just run this highlighted code, that's an envelope. But when we say dot plot, not only does it have the side effect of plotting it, the the result of this line of code is no longer an env. It's a different kind of class called a plotter. And envgen is not expecting a plotter. And so it doesn't know what to do with that, which is why it gives us that message. So it's not a good idea to plot an envelope inside of a synthesis function because you're going to get some wacky results. So. Right. So now we've got a little percussive filtered noise burst. And if we wanted, we could... Uh, you know, make uh, make an argument for the frequency so it's not always 1,000, but I'm just going to throw some values in here. Right. Okay, so um, w it might be tempting to think, okay, great, got it, nailed it, envelopes, uh, next subject. But I want to bring up the, the node tree. And this is a, a visual representation of all of the synthesis processes that are on the server. Uh, right now and we don't hear anything but we see all of these uh all of these little 
you know, temporary synths or these little white boxes, right? And I'm just going to run this a few more times. I just want you to see what happens. Right. It's going, it's going. And every time it, it adds a new process. And and if you look down here at the bottom right, you can see that my CPU is... is uh, has been creeping up steadily. You can jump back in the in the video, you know, a, a minute or two, and you'll see that it's it was below one, and now it's up at three. And if I keep doing this, it really it starts to pile up. And what's happening here is that even though we don't hear sound, uh, we, once we create these processes, you know, you've you've noticed we've never done like dot free or any command period or or anything like that. And so what happens is. Um, Things like pink noise, they have no end. They're just going to keep generating values. And uh, envgen is, is like that too. If we don't tell it to do anything otherwise, it, it has a particular sh uh, signal uh, shape determined by this envelope function. And it goes from 0, go it goes to 1, and then back to 0. And then it just sits at its last value. So it sits at 0, and it just stays there. And in fact, we can pull this envgen, uh, and we'll just, we'll just run this. So it, it went up and it went down and it, now it's just spewing out zeros. Right? There they are. There they go. And so the, our our CPU here is calculating this signal out of it. It's it's continuing to calculate sample values uh, at the sampling rate, um, and it's been doing that for all of these. So so we anyway this is so eventually if we do this we'll start to get clicks and pops and the um, the server will start to fail and we'll get you know drop samples. It'll be it'll be a mess and so um. So this brings up the concept of uh, done actions, and I'm just going to hit command period here to clear all this away. Um, the by default we we create a synthesis process and it and it never disappears, but if we go to the nfgen help file, we can see that there's an argument called uh, done actions. Let's read about it. As the name suggests, it's the action to be taken when the unit generator is done. Uh, so it's uh, it's an integer representing the action uh, to be taken. Let's go to the done help file, and we should be able to just scroll down and yeah, here we go. So actions. The default value in NGN is zero, and the uh, the action is do nothing when the ugen is finished, or in other words, when NGN reaches the end of its end shape. So do nothing. And that's exactly what it's doing. It's the the process is still alive and being calculated, and uh, but that's not really what we want. So I want uh, there's like fourteen or fifteen uh, done actions, uh, but the only ones I've ever used are zero and two. Zero is do nothing. Two is free the enclosing synth. So the enclosing synth is is this this process here, this this uh, white thing here. So if we say if we if we Instead of a semicolon here, if we say comma, okay, let's get some more arguments here. So we kind of have to skip past gate, level scale, level bias, time scale. I don't, I don't really want to have to enter values for all of these. So I'm just going to say, let's skip right over to done action colon. And you can see this done action here turns bold. So it knows, okay, I see, we're, we're just going to specify done action. And the default is zero, but we're going to say two. And I'm going to hit command period to clear away the, uh, the junk on the node tree. And now, watch what happens when we run this code. So we can just go nuts on this now. Right? And they all take care of themselves. They clean up after themselves, right? They, the engine is like, okay, I'm doing my business. Here we go. We're going up. We're going down. Let me. I, we got to the end. Let's check the done action. Oh, done action two. Free the enclosing synth. And bam, it vanishes. It's, it's like it was never there. So done action two is really, really handy. And in fact, it's really, really important because if you have some more complex sound that has a lot of a lot of algorithms, a lot of processes that are playing and turning on and this and that, if if you have an envelope but you forget done action two, uh, it'll sound like the sound has stopped. And it that sound has stopped. But if you don't have done action two, the synthesis process will keep calculating values in the background and eventually that'll pile up and before you know it, your CPU is at like 50% or 75% or something. So that's done action two. A <coughs> uh, few other, let's see. Any, if anyone's got any questions about ENDS, uh, envelopes, ENFGEN, et cetera, you can uh, fire away. 
uh, let's I the env.new is you can pretty much get the always get the job done with env.new, but I do want to show a few other handy envs. Um, so instead of env.new, there's env.perk, and uh, this is a short for percussive envelope. Um, so if you use done action zero, you'd have to end it manually. Yeah, that's right, with a free command, right? You you would have to either hit command period or um, like if we say uh, done action zero, right? So now we have this thing. So command period does take care of it. But if we gave this a name, then we could also say x dot free. And so you, it, it's hard to tell in the post window, but these values are moving, right? They're flying by. So if we say x dot free, then this little guy goes away and the the post window has calmed down so free works as well so done action two is kind of like an auto free thing it's like oh the the finite you know unit generator has ended done action two it's gone i don't have to worry about it so env.perk is an alternative to env.new we provide an attack time release time in seconds a peak level and a curve value so if we say um it basically this is a this is a percussive envelope. So it's a quick attack, a one second decay, and a, a curve of minus point. It's kind of exactly what we've been doing here, but it's just a few a few less values. And in fact, if you want to just take the defaults, it looks it looks like this. So it, we could we could swap this in if we wanted to, you know, just have a little bit not quite as much stuff to type. So we can just say env.perk right here and done action two. And we should get more or less the exact same sound. And I forgot some. Oh, you know what? We need a comma. That's right. So if we don't have a comma, then uh, that's what Super Collider sees. Perk on action. Right? Doesn't mean anything. So there we go. And we don't really need this pole either. That's going to clog things up a little bit. So there's env.perk. There's env.triangle, uh, which gives us a lovely triangle shape. We, of course, there's some arguments here. Um, we can say just, oh, duration and level. I guess that's it. So it's a pretty pretty minimal env. Uh, env dot, I think there's env dot sine. So that gives us a little segment of a sine wave. Again, we probably just have duration and level. Yeah. So by default, it's one second. And, and there's, and I do want to mention uh, env dot um okay so these are all env dot new perk sign and for the most part these are all fixed duration envelopes uh which means they have a beginning they have an end and they have a fixed duration so we, we know how long they're going to take but that's uh that's not the case when you if you've got like some synthesis plugin and a dhw and you got your midi controller and you're pressing holding down a key and you release it so y you get to decide how long it is uh, and that, that wouldn't really work with something like env.perk or env.sign because we'd start the note and then no matter what we do, no matter when we lift our finger, it's going to end when it's going to end. So there are, there's uh, env.adsr and uh, that is, uh, you have an attack, attack time, decay time, sustain level, and release time. Uh, so an ADSR needs needs an addition, needs a bit of additional information. It needs to uh, be know, okay, when am I turning on and then when am I starting my release? So uh, let's let's plug that in as well. And I'm gonna gonna I guess we could we could plot one of these maybe. Uh, m dot adsr dot um, plot. And I think we do we say like the sustain time? Eh, no, it's not quite what I wanted. Uh, that's that's not a good. That's not ignore that. Um, but let's let's copy the sound function and do an adsr envelope. <coughs> so we'll say ADSR, and just for clarity, we'll say quick attack time, uh, quick decay time, sustain level 0.3, and a one second release. All right, so there's our envelope. We have done action two, so it'll uh, free itself when we hit the end of this envelope. But we also need to um, <coughs> tell it how long to sustain, and the way we do that is with a gate argument. So that's the second argument for envgen. We give it the envelope and then we give it the gate. So we're gonna do an argument. We're gonna say arg gate. Because this is something we definitely wanna be able to input into 
uh, you know, a as we play this. So, all right, what I've done is I've declared a gate. It's zero by default, which means the gate is closed. Uh, the gate is basically it's either zero or one. Uh, it, it's by, that's usually our convention, and by default it's zero, which means the envelope doesn't start yet. So if we play this, um, we see that we've established a little synthesis node on the server here, and you know this this looks right, but we don't hear anything, and we don't uh, if we were to you know open up our scope, uh, we wouldn't see anything either. So now what we can do is we can say x.set gate1. And what this will do is it'll open the gate, which will cause the envelope to do its attack, its decay, and will stay at a value of 0.3 indefinitely. Right, so there it goes. And then we can say uh, x.set gate0 to trigger it's one second release, and then also also watch the uh, watch the uh, the node tree here at the top. You'll see after one one second after I run this line, that little white box will disappear, right? Because we have done action two, and uh, that means we can't reopen this gate anymore, right? Because we've we've destroyed that synth. So it it says, "Whoa, uh, I don't know one 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 zero. Where'd that one go? It doesn't exist anymore." And sure enough, it doesn't. So uh, and that's 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 what it means to free a synth is to truly destroy it. So if we set uh, done action to zero, right? Initially the gate is zero. We'll turn it on. There's our attack, decay, and sustain. And if we set the gate to zero, the envelope goes to the end, but the synth remains. Which means we can say, okay, let's let's turn on that gate again. Right? So now we don't have to create and destroy, but instead we can selectively just kind of turn it on, turn it off. And you know, we can we can run this gate one all day. It doesn't reset the envelope. It's just, it's already on. It's like trying to turn a light switch on that's already on, right? We can turn it off. It's the only thing we can do. So on, off. So that is um, uh, nf.adsr. And the the, um, the gates actually, they, they are um, relevant. Um, so when gates when gates one uh, it actually stays the same portion until we set gate zero. Yes, that is exactly what it does. When we set the gate to one, it starts from the beginning, does its attack decay, and arrives at its sustain level. And if we just leave it alone, it stays there forever, much in the same way that pink noise will just generate signal forever. All right. So one one more quick thing about envelopes and gates. Let's go back to our percussive envelope. Uh, so we had, uh, let's just do nf.perk and done action two. So we've seen this before. And oh, okay, gate is zero. Let's get that one. All right. All right, so the same principle applies even with fixed duration envelopes. If we provide a gate argument and it is zero, then we won't play initially. But we can say, you know, okay, set your gate to one, and then it starts. And and in this case, setting gate to zero is kind of irrelevant. So we need to take a little bit of a different approach here. Uh, let's make done action um, zero here. Uh, and let's do command period just to clear away that stuff. So done done action zero, and we have a percussive envelope with the gate initially off. So now we turn it on, right? And we can't immediately retrigger it because the gate is still technically open. So we need to say, okay, shut the gate, now open it again. And that has the effect of, of re-triggering re, uh, re the envelope. But it's kind of clumsy to have to manually turn it off and on. Um, the gate changes during the middle phase. Does the ADSR just jump to release? Or to uh, that's a good question. Yeah, like if it's a really long, slow envelope, uh, if if the if it's in the middle of like it's an attack it's attack phase and you say uh, just kidding gate zero it will start it will go from wherever it happens to be at that moment and it will transition to the to the uh, final value over the release duration so yeah it basically begins its release phase immediately um, wherever it happens to be um, so so this uh, we have we have this percussive envelope that we'd like to be able to just re-trigger on command. 
but we have to do this clumsy thing of turning the gate off and then turning it on. So there's a little trick here, which is involves the use of a, a, a t underscore argument. So if we say if we precede an argument with a t underscore, it becomes a trigger type argument. Um, and this these behave a little bit differently. Basically, whenever a trigger type argument is set to a non-zero value, uh, it will go to that value and then immediately jump back to zero. So it's kind of like automatically doing this step for us here. So I think now if we say uh, t underscore gate one, this should trigger the percussive envelope. And now we should just be able to do this again and again and again. Right? So what's happening here is that this value, we're saying go to one, and it says, sure thing, I'm at one, just kidding, now I'm at zero. Right? So it's just a quick on off. Right? So it's just it, it's a trigger, basically. It's a trigger, it's just an instantaneous positive value that resets itself. Right. Okay, uh, that that's envelopes. I want to move on. Uh, it's probably a little bit more than I maybe needed to cover, but it, it does take a little bit of time to digest. And envelopes are really, really important uh, just for, as a way of controlling parameters with custom shapes and being able to give sounds a beginning and an end. So let's move on to arrays. Now, uh, arrays pop up all the time. Um, we create arrays by making an enclosure of square brackets, and let's say uh, we'll fill this one with 2, uh, 30, um, 4.5, and the string hello. Right. So there we go. Uh, what is... Oh, you know what? <laughs> That's funny. Okay, it's because I already made this thing called x, and... No, wait, no, I, think I just forgot the equal sign. No, I, th I thought there was something much sillier happening. Uh, but no, I just forgot an equal sign. My mistake. Okay, so we say x equals uh, uh, an array. Square brackets with things inside separated by commas. They can be whatever you want. In some programming languages, you have to declare variable types, or arrays all have to have the same type of thing in it. Not super polite. Uh, if we want to access a particular item, I would say, you know, give me the item at a particular index. Um, so this, this um, we can say, how, how big is it? X dot size is 4. It's got four index slots. And I want to say, okay, what's, and the, the indices are, uh, this might be a little bit unusual for those of you with, with little programming experience, but we always start counting at zero. This is the item at index zero, the item at index one, index two, and index three. So we can say x dot at zero. And if we run this, we get the zeroth item. x dot at two will give us 4.5. So we can, we can request, we can say, tell me what's in the following slot. And as a syntax shortcut for this, we can just do x and then immediately open square brackets, no space, at 2, and that gives us the item. And we can also modify, uh, I, th I think we can also say x dot at 2 uh, equals uh, uh, 97. I think this will work. No. Uh, I think maybe we can't do it with at. I think we can do it. Yeah, okay, so this, this syntax works here. x at 2 using the square brackets equals 97, and then it actually modified our array, x. So now it's 2, 30, 97. Hello. Right. So that's, that's getting and, and setting items in an array. We have an array. It's a collection of ordered things. Right. All right, so uh, let's, let's talk about just numbers, for example. Uh, we can also make an array. Uh, let's, let's say we want, like, an array of... Uh, uh, a G, a arithmetic series, like the, um, like starting at five and then every multiple of five. Right? So we'll say x equals array. Uh, I mean, we, we could we could do you know like five, ten, uh, fifteen, but this becomes very very tedious. So we can say array dot series. Uh, how many? What do we want the size of the array to be? Let's say twenty. Twenty items. We'll start at five and we're going to step by five. So we'll start at five, then go up to ten. 15, 20, et cetera. So that's a really nice way of getting an arithmetic series. There's also uh, geom for geometric series. So basically, we'll do 10 items here. And we're going to start at 2. And we're going to grow by 3. So we're going to start at 2, multiply that by 3, multiply that by 3, multiply that by 3. Uh, and we'll do that until we have 10 items in the array. So 2 multiplied by 3 is 6, multiplied by 3 is 18, etc. 
So this is a good way, you know, obviously you can get powers of two this way. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that's the geometric series. It's, it's good for, it's a really useful uh, thing here is let's say I want like 12 overtones. The fundamental is 100 hertz. And um, uh, no, no, actually we need series for this. So we, we would say, let's copy this. If we want a harmonic a series, then we'd say let's, uh, 20, 20 harmonics, fundamental of 100, and we're gonna step by 100. So this gives us all of the, you know, the, the first 20 harmonics of a 100 hertz fundamental. Um, we can change this to be, okay, let's, I want um, you know, 80, so these are harmonics of 80 hertz, et cetera. So it's, an, it's a nice way to um, create larger arrays. Um, and uh, so uh, we, can, we can randomize the order of an array. Uh, so here's our, here's our array of uh, 20 harmonics of 80 hertz. We can say x equals x dot scramble. <coughs> And it just chooses a random order, which can be pretty fun. I think if we say, uh, if we don't do x equals, then it will uh, return a scrambled array, but it doesn't actually modify the receiver x. So x is unchanged. X is, x is still the original order. So that's, that's why if you want to actually mutate the array, we have to set it equal to a scrambled version of itself. <coughs> uh, right. What else? Oh, we can we can pick a random value. This is this is useful. If we just say, okay, here's our here's our array x, which contains harmonics of eighty hertz, and uh, give give me a random harmonic of eighty hertz. We can say x dot choose. Okay, and it picked three twenty. This time it picked six forty. So it's a good way of just picking from an array. I use this all the time. X dot choose is really handy. And um, okay, and then some some useful shortcuts here. Uh, we know we have array dot series, so we like if we want all the integers between zero and hundred, we can use array dot series for that. But here's a here's a really nice shortcut. We open parentheses, not square brackets. Parentheses. We type the first number we want, and then a double dot, and then the last number we want. And so this will give us the array uh, from zero to hundred, all the integers. Um, you know, you can even, I, I think if you do a ton of stuff, it's just not going to post it all. It's going to say, okay, you get the idea. I'm not going to give you, <laughs> I'm not, I got, I got things to do. Uh, so, uh, and, and the, basically when you do, when you do this shortcut here, the default step is one. Um, so, uh, if we were to do, you know, 25 to, uh, 40, uh, we're going to get, uh, 25 to 40, step of one. But if you want like all the odd numbers, for example, you can say one comma three dot dot ninety nine. And this this uh, syntax here tells it the step value. So we're going to go from one to three and then give me the rest until we get to ninety nine. So that's going to that's going to do that. We can say, you know, seven. So it goes one, seven, 13, 19. So a really, really handy way of just making a large array using an arithmetic series. It's a little bit less typing than using a dot series. All right, we'll come back to these because I want to get to randomness and then we're going to kind of lug all these together. So randomness, very quick intro to randomness in Super Collider. Uh, it's very, very common that we'll want to make a random number because sound is really fun and we can randomize aspects of it. So there are two main methods that I use all the time. One of them is rrand and xrand. So our rand, we provide a low value and a high value. And we run this line, we're going to get a random number between these two. So it's inclusive. So it might pick one, it might pick 10, and it's going to be somewhere in there. And our rand, is, I forget what the R is for. Uh, I don't know, maybe it's regular. <laughs> I actually don't know. But it's a, it's a uniform distribution. I think it's a linear distribution. So every every number is equally likely to be picked. Um, so you know, let's see, we'll just 1, 1 to 100. You're just going to get a nice even spread. So it could be any number. Uh, X brand is similar. We provide a minimum and a maximum. But uh, this is an exponential distribution, which means it's going to tend towards low values. 
Uh, so if we run this, uh, it's not the most convincing, but you can see there's a lot of ones, twos, and threes. Right? We've got one, two, one, one, three, one, and you know there's just some. You're it's it's you're gonna get the full spread, but it's just it's basically um. No, actually, a, a ran, exp rand and exp range are. Oh, ranged random. Yes, that's what it's for. Thank you. That's right. It's ranged random. That's right. Um, okay, so that's that's these two, and you'll notice that this one here gives us uh, integers, and this one here gives us floats. Um, uh, exp rand always gives floats, no matter no matter what you provide it. Uh, R rand will give you int. Uh, integers if both the minimum and maximum are integers. But if you make one or both of these into a float, then you will get uh, floats from R rand as well. Um, of course, you can always round your results to like the nearest hundredths place or something. So um, you, c you can always, you can basically get what however many decimal places you want. Ranged rand, regular. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for reminding me of that. Uh, Okay, so um, now we're going to kind of put all this together. You remember the dupe uh, shortcut, uh, exclamation point, we can say dot dupe two, or we can just say exclamation point two. So let's, let's apply this to randomness. And this is a, this is a kind of a subtle concept. It's, it's not immediately clear. So when we do exclamation point two, what do you expect to see? We're, we're making a random number, and we're going to say, okay, give me an array of, of two of these things, right? What happens here, if we, if we set our syntax like this, uh, we always, what happens is we, a uh, super collider generates a random number, and then it says, oh, you want two of these. Okay, so it copies that random number uh, so that it fills an array of size two. Um, and if we were to say, okay, just let's do it this way then, fine, if you're gonna be difficult. Now, if we if we manually create our array, then yeah, we get two random values that are uniquely generated. But it's it's stupid to have to do this, right? So there there must be a way. Right? There must be a way to do this. Um, and the answer is we put it in curly braces and make a function. And now now why does this work? Because when we uh, when we say you know, what what is I'm just going to run this highlighted code here, and it says that's a function. So uh, I would I would expect to see in the post window, or you might expect to see, a function, a function, right, like this, um, because that's that's what we're duplicating. This is a function. But if we duplicate a function, functions behave just a little bit differently. Um, when you duplicate a function, uh, it um, it ev it fills an array with that function and then evaluates that function for each time we copy it. So. Yeah, putting putting a random number generator in in curly braces to make it into a function, and then duplicating that gives us um, it'll it'll run the code inside that function for every item it needs to create in the array. So this is this is a subtle concept, um, uh, and it, and it does it does play into um, unit generators as well. So the the last the last uh, last little bit I want to spend here um, is uh, let's let's put it all together. So. All right, so we are going to say um, to our sig, sig equals fine off dot ar, and we'll say freak times 0.2. And we're just going to play this. Now, if we run this now, we don't get anything because it doesn't know what freak is. So we're going to make um, another argument called freak. We're going to say freak equals uh, exp rand. Uh, and we're going to, let's see, some suitable frequency values, maybe 200 to 2,000. And uh, and we're going to say xlam dupe. And so this, this gives us an array of two uniquely generated values. And that gets plugged in here. So this is an array of those two values. And uh, SuperCollider does something called multi-channel expansion, which is when you provide an array for a unit generator of size n, 
uh, the, that expands outward to create an array of size n containing uh, those unit generators. Uh, let me just, just give you an example here. So if we say uh, sine osc dot ar 400, 800, uh, Super Collider will interpret, will, will basically translate this into uh, this. The array containing two sine waves with the items from the original array distributed accordingly. And then the way the server is going to play this is by putting this in the left speaker and this in the right speaker. And uh, so, so let's just run this, I guess. Wow, that's, they were very close together. That's very interesting. <laughs> that's, that's almost the same. That's, that's pretty rare. Ah, yeah, okay. It did it twice. <laughs> I expected to see something like this on the first time. All right, so this is not the most interesting thing in the world, but uh, I just want to take this just a bit further. And l what if we say um, eight? Okay, so I want eight frequencies. It's going to dump that array of eight frequencies in here, and it's going to expand into an array of eight sine osc. Now, if we open our meters, uh, stat meter, uh, we only have two uh, output channels. So where do the other six go? Well, they don't go anywhere. They, I mean, they they do. They go to these, you know, the sort of invisible buses that, but I'm, I've got headphones and we're streaming here. And so we, we can't stream eight channel audio. It's just not, it's not in the cards. Uh, but we'll, we'll try this anyway. And you know, it doesn't, doesn't sound any different. We could even say, you know, give me 32. Yeah. We can do this all day long. Basically you can imagine these output channels just keep going. We can, we can create them if we want, but it's kind of useless unless we actually have that many speakers to produce each one of these tones. Right now we only have two. Um, so there's a couple of methods here that are very useful. So here's H and this this uh, SIG after this line is an array of eight sine osc. But we're gonna say SIG uh, dot sum. Uh, and what that's gonna do is that's gonna add all of the contents of the array together. So if we do this with numbers, this gives us well, it's going to add all these together. Now, what happens when you add eight sine osks? Well, you're doing additive synthesis, right? It's going to add this sine with, with this sine, with this sine, with this sine, and you're going to get the sum of all those sine waves. Uh, I'm going to turn this down just a little bit more, but we should hear eight sine waves mixed together in the left. And we do. So maybe we should duplicate that like this. Right? Turn this down even more. And now the obvious thing to do here is just kind of go crazy. Let's make 64. Yeah, we can we can even go down to like I don't know, 40 hertz and up to 10,000 hertz. Yeah, so now we have some like spaceship sounds or something. Uh, this is this could be even more interesting. Um, uh, what we're doing is we're we're making sixty four sine waves, mixing them down to a monophonic signal, and then copying that monophonic signal. So uh, that's what that has. That's the effect of you know we we have our our cool sound, but then we just have it right in the middle stereo, uh, right in the middle of the stereo field, and we don't get a an interesting spread image or anything. So. Uh, what you can do here is, um, let's see. Uh, well, okay, I'll just, I'll do what I would do here, which is to use a unit generator called uh, splay. So splay takes an array of signals, uh, any size, and will spread them across the a stereo field. So what it's going to do here is take uh, the um, we're not we're not summing anymore, so we're uh, we're not yeah. So we we have a sixty four sine os. So it's going to put the the zeroth one on the left. It's going to put the sixty third one on the right, and it's going to sort of space them uh, in between. So I think this should sound pretty cool. Yeah, but it's it's quite quiet. I think uh, Splay does some amplitude compensation.
And then a nice thing to do here is let's put it back together again with our uh, revisit our envelopes. And we're going to say env equals envgen.kr, uh, env.new. Um, let's say we're going to go 0, 1, 0. Uh, five seconds up, five seconds down uh, with a little bit of uh, curvature. And we're going to say done action two. And then we're going to make sure to apply this envelope. Make it a little bit shorter. And done action two takes care of the uh, freeing business so they don't pile up. But Maybe we want to round these to the nearest multiple of 100. So just if we run this a few times, just this stuck inside the curly braces, you'll see it's always going to be rounded to a multiple of 100, which means we're going to get a uh, harmonic series around, uh, whoops, we, we do need that actually, around uh, 100. So. And then if we wanted to detune this a little bit, maybe we'd uh, uh, we'd, we'd like add, I guess, um, a random value between, I don't know, minus 4 and positive 4. Is this going to be cool? I don't know. Yeah, so it's got like a little bit of a pulsing character to it. Round this to 50. So this is this is usually where I get carried away, um, and I don't want to make this too complicated. We can we can simplify it again. But uh, if you if you've got a solid understanding of uh, arrays and randomness, and and then if you can also apply envelopes, then you really have already have a ton of tools at your disposal to um, uh, to just make some interesting sounds that have a nice shape, amplitude shape, and then every time you run this code, it'll be a little bit different. Uh, you know, so it's, it's uh, possibilities are really kind of endless here. You can try different unit generators. Uh, anyway, I, I, I really encourage you to, to, to get into the help files, and uh, let's see, there's a couple of help files I want to point out here, randomness. Um, so there's a help file called randomness, which goes through all of the uh, random number generators. Good examples here. There is a uh, help file called multi-channel expansion, I think. Multi-channel expansion. So this kind of explains how the server interprets arrays and how you can take advantage of it. And um, I should have said this last week, but uh, the, you know, the, the I, I kind of want to treat my uh, regular tutorial series as like a supplemental textbook. So if you haven't already, uh, definitely watch tutorial one and two and uh, sort of sample from the next four or five tutorials as you see fit. Uh, I think four covers envelopes. Uh, five covers multi-channel expansion. So um, they're reasonably short videos. It's, it's, they're a lot more compact than me just rambling on up here. But uh, that's that's really what I wanted to focus on this week: is envelopes, uh, basics of arrays, and the basics of randomness. And just to give you a taste of trying to put all those together to make sounds which are considerably more interesting than just a sine wave or pink noise or something. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna call it here. But uh, if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to stick around. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching. <coughs> No problem. Happy to stream. <coughs> All right, so if you're 
uh, guess for those of you in my class, I'll see you on Thursday for the next uh, set of in-class and take-home problem sets. In the meantime, feel free to email me if you've got any questions. And uh, all right, look forward to seeing you on Thursday in class and everyone on Twitch. I uh, will be here same time next week, and we'll dive into some more cool Super Splatter stuff. So thanks again. See ya.